Hey guys, what's going on, man? All right, uh, third video of the night. Um, I kind of wonder if I'll upload these in order. You know, I didn't kind of think it through, but I just shot a video with the VHS haul, the random act of kindness from MRSKI. Uh, <laughs> I always forget numbers, 361. And now I'm kind of getting what I'm, uh, what's, what I've, you know, kind of unintentionally ended up being a comic book haul, haul over the last month just from traveling and riding around. There's a, lot, there's a couple of things going on uh, with, with this hobby. I've slowed down a whole lot. Uh, this is my 40th, 40th year collecting. Um, just due to circumstances and good fortune and good luck, I really hit it hard. Uh, had found a lot of great deals and a lot of just all sorts of things that you just can't pass by for probably the last eight or nine years. You know, a lot of great deals, a lot of fortunate things, a lot of things I was, I was able to turn around on eBay and get more more stuff. I uh, kind of wish I'd spent some of that money on a decent light if I'm going to be doing this this YouTube thing for as long as I have been doing. But I've also kind of stepped away from social media, and uh, it's all about public accountability. I'm not one of those people where it's going to be sort of like, well, damn the internet. And but there is a lot of negativity, and it's up to you to decide if you're going to let that in or not. You know, uh, that's it's across the board. Instagram seems to be the safest place to go, in my opinion. I'm really barely on Twitter, guys, and if I put anything on Facebook, I'm either in the bathroom, bored, stuck in traffic, or I'm just on another site and I'm sharing something I th think is interesting or I want to find later or something like that. And I hate to say it, but it's 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 kind of working. There's a few things coming back that I really am able to enjoy more, like when I went and saw Ghost in the Shell with my girlfriend. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't really aware, uh, leading up to the movie, of all the, some of the negativity out there about it and stuff. It was a fun movie. It was a great movie. Um, so yeah, getting away from some of that stuff and doing it. So yeah, I'm, I'm hardly ever on social media anymore. So for the reason I'm putting that out there is there's quite a few people, surprisingly, uh, try to get a hold of me, and I just apologize for not getting back to you. I really don't check that much. I took some of the stuff off of my phone um, as I get a message, which is funny. So, uh, yeah, I kind of apologize, and I've also slowed down on YouTube. Um, I was, it's just time to, you know, I'm just working a lot. I uh, was sick last week. Life goes on. Spent some time with my girlfriend. You know, things like that. Nothing bad. You know, just it's time to slow down. So, in that time, I skipped a comic book convention because I wasn't feeling very well and a few other things going on and stuff like that. So, uh, a couple of them so far. I found out there's like two, I think two around here. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving on with that, I still ended up finding stuff after he listened to me ramble for three minutes, okay? So this is the things I found just kind of stopping here and stopping there when I had time or if it was on my way somewhere. I didn't really set out to stop at any of these places except for one place. So the first thing I want to show you is I got this for I think five bucks or something and it turns out this is the one I, I has a lot of nostalgia for me. This is, as you can see, a Marvel Treasury Edition, Marvel's TV sensation because there was a, a couple Spider-Man TV movies that were on to television. But uh, this is The Astonishing Spider-Man, co-starring the X-Men, Iron Fist, Werewolf by Night, Ghost Rider, and more and more people. With a great cover by, by, by Bob Budinsky. I think that's how you say it, Ernie Kahn. Just great, man. But these these are some of the stories I remember. Uh, Gil Kane's stories on Spider-Man. So when I was a kid, you know, I was covered in there, man. I was always infatuated with the, I remember the inside covers that my stepdad or uncle had these. I always remember the inside cover more than I did the actual cover. Go figure, you know. And there's always something great on the back of these. So that's just fantastic. That's all your villains that are in there. And I'll sit there and just look at these and study these and stuff. So I get to put that with the stack. That was a fantastic find. Also, I'm trying to complete this series because my favorite inker of all time is Tom Palmer. And then to have him at this time, this was the second time I saw him do this. First was on Star Brand, and the second time was on X Men: The Hidden Years. Uh, it was Tom Palmer inking John Byrne, which I thought was fantastic. And X Men: The Hidden Years, I don't know how long John Byrne or Marvel or whatever was going on had in mind to keep this series going, but there was a time where they stopped producing new X Men stories and just did reprints up until about issue ninety four 
or 96 watch me go blank it's late but anyway they reprinted a whole bunch of stories there for years I think they were like on a bi-monthly schedule back then too I'm not sure um, and um, you know even though Adams couldn't really save the X-Men so they started for some reason kept publishing them as reprints X-Men uh, giant size X-Men number one comes out well then wine kind of starts pushing giving the reins to Chris Claremont there and we got our X you know we got our uncanny X-Men well this was the series that was supposed to fill in the gaps of what was going on with the X-Men in continuity uh, during the reprint years these were new stories showing you what was going on with them and I, I dug what he was doing uh, I like the story I like the some of the arcs I like some of the new continuity John Byrne was putting in there not because it's a great classic deep read but because it was just fun you know I didn't have the wave of nostalgia for it because either I wasn't a, you know, I, I, you know, the reprints were already going on and I was born somewhere in the middle of it, it uh, yeah nothing like that so that it was a fun series but this is issue 22 the last one so I think I have over half the series so I might need to do it okay then I found these for two bucks I just was walking around and I looked over and I went oh my and uh, I found two great issues man uh, this might have been the week after uh, Bernie Wrightson died but uh, it's uh, one of my favorite issues of Swamp Thing, issue number seven, uh, from the Bronze Age, Lindwine and Bernie Wrightson doing a you know Swamp Thing number seven. There was some Batman action going on. That was a fan two. I you know, got fat these for two bucks. And number nine, I might already have this. And even though these are not mint books by any shape, weight, you know, any form, excuse me, this might be an upgrade for me. But God, look at that cover. It's one of those covers that'll catch your eye and you'll just walk on, but you really need to stop and really look at what he did in there. It's amazing stuff. All right, then I think I found this uh, for five bucks, which is cool. I was happy to pay five bucks for this. I kind of wish I never sold the four issues that I got off the rack back in the day. But, uh, you know, it's kind of cool to... I had to have this one because it has a UPC symbol in it, which, you know, which is on it. But, uh, yeah, Batman 404... Uh, a mint copy of uh, part one of year one fantastic David Muchacelli some fantastic work in this and I can you can you can read this book and look at the art and you, you see Frank Miller in there so he this you know to me this is one of the un, most underrated uh, teams in comics ever uh, I think they jumped over and did a you know a little daredevil story you might have heard of what you guys guess on that all right and then I found these on a road trip when I was out with my girlfriend I uh, had to grab these and rookie mistake rookie mistake because uh, when I got this uh, I'm missing a few issues of the John Byrne run of Wonder Woman but this has a George Perez cover and I'm like oh that's why I couldn't get it and it's a bit of a uh, callback to issue one that George Perez uh, you know drew and uh, before he took over the reins so I get this and I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. I think I paid a few bucks for it. And then I get it out when I get home or wherever, wherever I was at. And it's kind of beat up on the back. And I'm like, yeah. So, yeah, but still cool to have. And then we have Wonder Woman 119. Uh, just a fantastic Philip Jose Garcia Lopez cover there, I do believe. But, uh, yeah, we get into Cheetah. And this this actually leading up to uh, her 10th anniversary of this series and stuff. Byrne was taking her to some dark places here about her mythology and stuff and her origin. She was turning back to clay, had a shattered hand. Okay, and then uh, I hit a flea market. Uh, just a random flea market on the side of a of a, of a interstate. Uh, I don't want to say where because it's my honeypot. But uh, I found this. You see this trade? Okay, this is the one that has always uh, been very elusive. This is Neil Gaiman, The Sandman in Endless Nights. Now, I think I had the novelization somewhere, right? But this is the trade of each character, each member of Sandman's family, The Endless. They each get a freaking story with a different artist. We got Glenn Farby, Frank Quietly, P. Craig Russell, Bill Sinkovich. Some other people I don't know, but they have beautiful work in here, man. So, uh, this is, I think this is the adaption of the book of short stories that he did, okay, Endless Nights. One dollar, a little beat up, little, you know, corners I'm going to fix with some rubber glue or a glue stick, put them back together on the ends. 
one dollar. I wish I could say I hustled that, but one dollar. And then I got this. Might put this on eBay. This is the Star Wars role playing game that I found at a Salvation Army. And I think I paid three bucks for it, if I remember right. And the thing is like brand new. Uh, number one, nobody to role play with around here. Number two, I don't know if I have the passion for it that I had during my Dungeons and Dragons days in the second edition and with my White Wolf gaming that I did in the 90s. So yeah, that was kind of cool. So then I hit a bookstore and I took a whole bunch of paperback novels that I had and I got store credit for it and I was able to get these uh, just in trading. I got a beautiful tale, The Tale of the Dark Crystal storybook. Uh, basically I get these for the art. So it's, I gotta get that sticker off of it. But I got these because, I mean this came out when the movie came out. This is 1982 or 1983. But the freaking art in it, man, is fantastic. I mean, oh, there's a dark. And when I'm filming this, there's a dark crystal story going on right now, a 12 issue series. I haven't got to see the art in it or anything like that. But uh, I wish we could go back to this kind of stuff. The, the art in this is just amazing. Let me see if I can find the. Uh, that's the one I wanted to show. The detail in this is not going to show up on this camera, but uh, the whole book is like this. This is fantastic, right? Then I found this, which I didn't even know that Innovation did in 1991. Uh, Incarnations of Immortality was a series of books by Piers Anthony. Uh, oh, it's right there on the cover, right? And the first one to come out was on a pale horse. Short story, short story. Each issue had the devil, and it was talking about immortal characters and stuff. They all tied. There's a thread going through all these novels that Piers Anthony did. I have them downstairs. Have, I think I have almost all of them paper on hardback. A few on. Uh, oh, my third video. I'm getting tired. But anyway, uh, I can't believe there's a uh, adaption of On a Pale Horse, and basically the guy tries to shoot himself. He meets death, kills death, ends up taking death's place. Okay. So I've always been kind of fascinated with that idea, you know. I also traded in for this, uh, for you guys that do not remember the 90s, Fox was actually thinking about trying to start making new Doctor Who, uh, a new Doctor, that's the way I heard it, new Doctor Who show in the 90s, so they made this movie. Um, I can't believe I'm going to blank in this, but we got our eighth Doctor, who that's the only time we saw him. Until a few years ago when they were celebrating an anniversary of Doctor Who and they gave him like a little 15 minute short that you can find on uh, YouTube and stuff. You know, sort of his return showing him turn into the War Doctor. So what, I, what do we have here is in trade I got this, but these are some strips uh, printed over in Britain. Uh, some magazine, I don't know if it's a Doctor Who magazine or whatever it was, but there's two or three volumes of these and these are heavy and they are full and they use up the whole page. And we get some, uh, I get to see some uh, adventures of the 8th Doctor who only had one shot in one crappy movie. Red Dwarf, Red Star, can't remember what it was called. I have it on VHS tape here somewhere. And then I got these, um, Penguin and Dreams, Bloom County stuff by Berkeley Breed. Uh, story of Opus and Build a Cat and all that stuff. I absolutely love these. These are a little bit beat up, but they'll just go downstairs with the rest of the books I have. Uh, then we got Billy in the uh, <laughs> Boingers bootleg. No, the album, I've already been asked online if I do I have the album that came with this. No, but the reason I waited to actually do this video and show this haul is I've just wanted it on eBay yesterday. I did not want the competition. That's okay. And then little DVD I got. I got this for, I think, a dollar, maybe two dollars. I got the Swamp Thing movie by Wes Craven. It's horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's it's worse than I remember, which it doesn't usually go that way. Usually things get better as time goes by. Uh, I also got this at an antique store for two bucks. Lost Boys, Joel Schumacher's uh, story with the subtext. You know, next time you watch this, just remember they're not just vampires. They are subtext for something. And then I got this for five bucks. Brand new at the same flea market that... Um, I got some of the Endless Nights uh, Sandman, but this is season three of the Muppet Show on DVD. It was brand new. I already popped it open. Watched the Alice Cooper episode on here. I got it for five bucks. So that's it. That's everything I do believe. Think. Oh, oh no, it's not. My buddy Tim Anderson, that I talk about every now and then, sent me a box of um, 
bags and boards you know he rebags everything I think he switched to mylar and stuff so he sent me a few things when I got when I picked up the box of bags and boards and stuff but got this Eclipse monthly which you know I was like okay that's cool that's cool I'll flip through that and we're into horror stuff right but then he got this in here and this was a jab at me faith number one from Valiant it's a good thing I'm not a edgelord it's funny thanks a lot guys y'all be cool